Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Jackson. I'm Artistic Director of Cardboard Citizens. Um, and thank you so much for coming on an early December night to share in a bit of work we've been making. So to just give you uh, a clear sense of what you're going to see, uh, we have been working with the historian uh, Nicholas Krausen, a professor at Birmingham University, who you will meet shortly. And he has done some remarkable work uncovering the voices of people prosecuted under the Vagrancy Act of 1824 in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, so these are the voices of people who we might have thought were not recorded at all or not heard. And that's sort of fundamental to Cardboard Citizen's mission to tell untold stories. Um, so it was a joy when we met Nick a few years ago and he started telling us about this remarkable work. And then uh, very kindly with his support and the support of Birmingham University, we've done a few days work trying to stand these voices up on their feet. Um, and that's what you're going to see this evening. So basically, uh, with four or five actors from Cardboard Citizens, some of whom have not been able to be present all the time, uh, we've done about a morning and a half's work just trying to bring these voices to life. As you'll see, um, most of the material comes from court transcripts or newspaper reports of court proceedings, or in some cases, workhouse records or public censuses. And from this work, um, we've tried to reconstruct the people. Some of you were with us last week when we inflicted on you uh, the full reading of the Vagrancy Act of 1824, which is quite a long thing. So you'll be glad to hear we're not going to do that to you again. But just to give you the tiniest flavor of it, um, could I ask uh, Tim Bennett to just start into start into it and give people a little bit of a flavor? Off you go, Tim, when you're uh, ready. The Vagrancy Act of 1824, still in force today for punishment of idle and disorderly persons, rogues and vagabonds, and incorrigible rogues in the, this part of Great Britain called England, enacted by the King's Most Excellent Majesty George IV in this Parliament by authority hereinafter accepted. Judges of assizes, justices at sessions, justices of the peace are empowered to order any convict upon discharge from prison to be conveyed by pass herein directed. Every person being able That's wholly or in part thing. to maintain... The remarkable himself. thing about the Vagrancy oh, Act is that it's very long and <laughs> it's very capacious and basically you can criminalize virtually anybody for doing virtually anything under the act. So we'll leave Tim to continue reading the Vagrancy Act and I'll tell you a little bit more about what you're going to see this evening. Um, that act is still in law and uh, lots of people we know have been prosecuted under that act. And one of the guests, uh, commentators, if you like, we have tonight is Hannah Slater from Crisis. Um, and Crisis, she's campaigns manager at Crisis. And one of their campaigns, a quiet campaign at the moment, is to get this piece of ancient legislation almost <coughs> years old uh, repealed. Um, so after we we're going to we're going to focus on two there's a dog in the house we're going to focus on two characters um tonight two people they're not characters they're real people um one is a woman called alberta kate wood um and the other is a man called James Butcher. Let's just go quickly back to Tim and see Every person betting in any public place or with any pretended game of chance, every person processing a padlock key or a crowbar or any implement with intent to felonious break into any building, every person armed with I a gun or cutlass. Even halfway through, um, so we'll just let him rumble on there in the background. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to read the transcriptions of one of these, uh, one of our subjects. Uh, we're gonna have a short discussion. We're gonna invite comments. We really would like your comments or observations or questions, particularly for our experts, if you like, um, 
who are Hannah and, uh, and of course, um, the historian Nicholas Krausen. But I happen to know that there are a number of other people in the house who could give us some very useful insight on this, who I will remorselessly pick on because I can see their names in front of me. So I apologize in advance. Finally, have we got to the end of the Vagrancy Act? Can we revert to Tim? Nothing herein applies to laws for the removal of poor persons in Scotland, Ireland, or in the Isles of Man, Jersey, and Guernsey, persons not having committed acts of vagrancy or herein after described. Law now forced relating to lunatic vagrants. Applause. Thank you very much, Tim, for um, delivering it, even if you were delivering much of it only to yourself. Okay, our first, um, our first subject of the evening is uh, Alberta Wood. Um, and first of all, I'm going to invite Kim, uh, the actor who's incarnating her, to tell us a little bit about Alberta. Kim. Alberta Wood, uh, alias is Kate Wood, was born in 1857 and possibly lived to be about 90. We have three lovely clear photos of her. They're mugshots from prisons, which kind of chart the course of her life. She married William when she was 19 and they had three children. Her second child was born in the workhouse, which was after her first conviction for stealing. And the stuff she stole was today, it seems inconsequential, trivial, like tablecloths, a silk handkerchief, a basket, uh, a child's jacket, for which she got two months hard labor. Her first son, Albert, died when he was six. And by 1883, she had desertion written in her notes and started calling herself widow, maybe for respectability, because her husband, William, was still alive in Leicester in 1901, but living with someone else. And we know that because in 1903, she was had up for stealing husband's trousers. So it was a complicated relationship. Kate liked to drink, and many of her offences are around conning her way into a place to stay for the night and then stealing stuff from the house in the morning. She must have known how to spin a yarn, not just as a hosiery doubler, which is her profession, but also she was a plausible con woman because she tricked her way into people's houses and good affections uh, for years. And she had some front in Southampton where she went for a, a, a straight job. She had a position in a decent house, but she lost it after three days. But during that time, she got cabmen to drive her around. By the time of her second photo, she was calling, us, she was calling her profession charwoman. So it was a bit of a step down. What I love about Kate is, Alberta, is that in her photos, she looks unashamed and unapologetic, straight onto the camera, deadpan, I'd have to say hangdog. She looks sad. It reminds me, her expression, of when, uh, of when my teenage boy used to say, and what, whenever I asked him, are you going out without your gloves, Dan? Kate looks sad. And I, I think maybe because she lost her child and her husband, and she just want, she drank perhaps because she needed to forget. And that's why she told the court by our last bit, I attribute my misfortune to drink. Thanks very much. So um, Alberta Wood, and we have some of those images which we hope to show you. Um, and she is often sporting a fantastic hat. Um, let's go when you're ready. Thank you. Alberta Wood, alias Kate Wood, nay King born 1857 to maybe 1947. Leicestershire, marriage register, 1876, marriage solemnized at the parish church in the parish of All Saints Leicester in the county of Leicester. Unmarried. 20th of February, 1876. Name and surname. Name and surname. William Wood. Alberta King. Age. 26 years old. 19. Condition. Condition. Bachelor. Spinster. Rank or profession. Shoe riveter. Residence at time of marriage. Junior, Junior Street. Street. Father's name and surname. John Wood. Joseph King. Rank or profession. Framework knitter. Lambswool spinner. 1881 census. 43 St. Peter's Lane, Leicester. Name and surname of each person. John Davis. Rosanna Davis. Alberta Wood. Albert Wood. Relation to head of family. 
Head. Wife. Border. Border. Condition as to marriage. Married. 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 Age last birthday. 24. 22. 23. Two. Rank, profession or occupation. Wagoner. Hosiery Doubler. Birthplace. Husbands, Bosworth, Leicestershire. Mount Sorrel, Leicestershire. Leicester. Leicester. Leicester Chronicle, 1st of July, 1882, Town Hall. Tuesday before J. Howcutt, Esquire, in the chair, and J.T. Pilgrim, Esquire. An unwelcome lodger. Alberta Woods was charged with stealing a jacket valued seven shillings from the dwelling house of John Malkin on the 17th of June. John Malkin. I live in Court A, St. Margaret Street, about nine o'clock, the night of the 16th of June, this woman came to my house and asked my wife, who was in at home alone for a night's lodging, saying she had a place for the following night. This woman was quite a stranger to my wife, and given that I was on business that night, she let her stay. Mrs. Malcolm, I was up first in the morning and the prisoner came downstairs about 7.30. She said she was going out to get something for breakfast and would return shortly, but she did not. I missed the child's jacket about 5.30, so I told the police what had happened. Mr. Palfreyman, the prisoner pawned that jacket at my shop for three shillings and sixpence. Anonymous policeman. On being told Mrs. Malkin of the theft, I visited Mr. Plyfreyman's pawn shop, and with that information, when looking for the woman, I found her in public house in Belgrave Gate. I am guilty. Nicholas Croson, contemporary historian. She's about five months pregnant here, and it must have been obvious to the court. So why is she stealing a child's jacket? Desperation? Wanting some clothing for the child? Chairman, you are sentenced to two months hard labour. Leicester Union Workhouse Admissions and Discharge Registers, 1882 to 1883. Date, name, Occupation, from parish of, age, parents' name, religion, admissions, observations. 22nd of September, 1882, Alberta Wood Spinner, from St. Margaret's, age 25. Religion, Wesleyan Methodist, pregnant. 16th of October, 1882, Albert Wood, male, St. Margaret's, one day old, Alberta Wood, Wesleyan Methodist, born in house. Leicestershire Baptisms, 1882. Baptisms solemnised in the parish of St. Peter's, Leicester, in the county of Leicester, in the year 1802. When baptised? When baptised? 30th of November, 1882. Child's Christian name? Arthur Sinclair. Parents name? William and Alberta. No name. Wood. Abode. Union Workhouse. Quality trade or profession. Sue Riverton. Leicester Union Workhouse Admission and Discharge Registers, 1883. See, read, date, name, occupation, one parish of, age, parents, name, religion, admissions, observation, discharge, date. 22nd of August 1883, Alberta Wood, Spinner of St Margaret's, age 26. Church of England. Desertion, 20th of September 1884, own request. I'm Arthur St Clair Wood. I'm one year old. My mother is Alberta Wood. Hampshire Advertiser, 10th of December 1890, Tuesday, Southampton, police court before Alderman J. H. Cooksey on the chair. Ingratitude and impudence. The magistrate's clerk, prisoner, state your name and abode for the court. Alberta Wood, widow, 77 Lansdowne Hill, Southampton. You are charged with stealing a pair of child's boots and other articles valued at 10 shillings from the Ship and Anchor Beer House, Winchester Street, on the 4th. William Henry Judd, landlord, that woman came to my house and said she wanted a bed. I told her that we were full, but she pleaded that she must sleep somewhere as she had come in from Lindhurst, where her husband lived and worked, and it was too late to go back. 
She gave her name as Smith and told me she had been looking for a cottage in Southampton, but had not succeeded in finding one. I decided to let her stay, and she slept all night in the room where the stolen articles were left. After she left, I noticed the items were missing, and I gave information to the police. Stephen Kimber, assistance to Mrs. Cohen, Pawnshop, French Street. The woman who gave her name is Ann Smith, brought those items to me and pawned them for three shillings. I am guilty and I'm very sorry. A belt of wood. You are further charged with stealing eight shillings and threepence in money, a silk handkerchief and a basket, together valued at 11 shillings, five pennies, the property of Louise Malden. Louisa Malden. I'm a married woman living at 5 Stamford Street. On Tuesday night, that woman, calling herself Anne Smith, came to the house and took a furnished room, explaining she had come from Lindhurst. I gave her food and she slept to the house. She left in the morning, but returned that evening, leaving again after a little while. It was then that I missed the money, which was kept in a butter dish in the front room, as well as the items. Police Constable Taylor, I arrested that woman and she admitted the charge. A belter would, you are also charged with stealing a pair of men's lace-up boots from 16 Northern Street, the property of Edward Miles, who has since died. Henry Stevens, nephew of Edward Miles, who has since died. <coughs> yes, <coughs> yes, those are my uncle's boots. Uh, he was wearing them Sunday week. I saw that woman in my uncle's house on that day. My Michael Emmanuel, pawnbroker. The woman, calling herself Anne Clark of Manchester Street, pawned the boots at my establishment. I am guilty of this too. And I should say it will not happen again. I came to town three months ago when I had a situation in a decent house, but I lost my place and I've been living on my wits ever Head since. Head Constable Clay, the prisoner has been instructing cabmen to drive her to shops and when there had, under pretense that she had left a purse at home, borrowed of them. She had also taken a house and lived in it alone for three nights without any furniture. Why, you impudent woman, you sent three cabmen to meet you at a house in the avenue? Chair of the Magistrates, these thefts are by their nature characterised as impudent. You will serve a month's imprisonment on each charge. Leicester Chronicle, 31st of March, 1894, Town Hall, Wednesday, before the Mayor, Alderman Hart, and Messrs. H.T. Chambers and B.C. Waits. An old offence. Albert Wood, 35, child woman, Leicester Road, stealing a pair of boots, two tablecloths, three dress skirts, a silver watch and a jet cross, valued at two pounds, two shillings, the property of Eliza Saunders, hosiery hand of two Asylum Street. Mrs Saunders, in March last year, when I was living at number eight Carlton Street, the prisoner came to my house on the night of the 8th and asked for lodgings. I agreed and accommodate her for the night or two. On the 11th, I went out to work. When I returned, the prisoner had left and taken the articles with her. I informed the police, but heard nothing more until last week when they were shown to me by the police. Detective Constable Allen, on receiving information, we found the items pledged at pawnbrokers in Braunston Gate and Charles Street. They had been lodged by Alberta Wood in mid-March last year. I took her into custody at Nottingham yesterday when she was discharged after serving six months for a subsequent conviction, and I brought her to Leicester. I am guilty, I admit. I attribute my misfortune to drink. You will serve one month. 1901 Census, Leicester, 29 Bedford Street, Common Lodging House. Name and surname of each person. Kate Wood. Relation to head of family. Lodger. Condition as to marriage. Widow. Age last birthday. 40. Personal occupation. Charwoman. Birthplace. Leicester. Leicester Daily Post, 23rd April 1901, Borough Police Court, yesterday, before T. Windley in the chair. Impudent theft. Alberta Wood, 39, Charwoman of Lee Street, was charged with stealing from a dwelling house in Middle Street on the 12th of February, a cape, the property of Miss Annie Bird. Mrs. Bird, the woman in the dock came to my house and asked for a penny. I asked, what for? She said, 
to get the half a pint. I've got the other penny. I decided to treat her, although she was a stranger, and went to a public house. Detective Constable Smith, the prisoner then left the public house and went back to Mrs Bird's house where she found a girl named Spriggs. The child was told by Wood to go and find Mrs Bird, which she did. When I returned home with the child, the prisoner had gone and afterwards I missed my cape. On Saturday last, I saw the woman in the marketplace and I told the police. I arrested the prisoner and asked what she had done with the cape. I pawned it with Mr Case. I admit I am guilty and I'm very sorry indeed. You will serve one month's hard labour. Nicholas Croson, historian. Note, she must be several months pregnant with her third child. Leicestershire Baptisms, 1901. Baptism solemnised in the parish of St Andrew in the borough of Leicester in the year 1901. And baptised. 4th of November, 1901. First Christian's name. Albert Edward. Parent's name. Alberta. Surname. Wood. Abode. Her Majesty's Prison, Leicester. Quality trade or profession. Charwoman. By whom the ceremony was performed. G. L. Dean. Note one, no father named. Note two, she is serving nine months for larceny, stealing clothes, Leicester Quarter Sessions. Habitual criminal register, 1902. Name, aliases, prison and register number. Alberta Wood, alias Kate Wood, age, uh, prison number, 266 Leicester. Height? Five foot one, three quarters. Um, complexion? Dark. Hair? Dark brown. Going uh, grey. Eyes. Brown. Brown eyes. Marks. Marks. Scar left temple. Under right jawbone ag abscess and left ear. Mole right temple. Offence place of conviction and place of committal. Larceny. Leicester Borough Sessions. Leicester. Sentence and date of committal. We've got six months. 11th of February 1903. Date when penal servitude expires or supervision commences. Date of liberation and intended address on occupations. 10th of August, 1903, 38 Liverpool Street, Leicester, charwoman. Leicester Workhouse Admission and Discharge of Records, 1903, <coughs> admitted. 22nd of April, 1903, Albert Edward Wood, age two, parent in jail. Discharged, 10th of August, 1903, Albert Edward Wood, taken by parent. 1911 census, Loughborough, Loughborough Union Workhouse, County of Leicestershire. Name and surname of each person? Kate Wood. Relation to head of family? Casual. Condition as to marriage? Widow. Age last birthday? 59. Personal occupation? Birthplace? Leicester. The Illustrated Leicester Chronicle, 20th, 9th, 20th of January 1970. Why she stole his trousers. At Leicester Police Court on Saturday, a married woman named Kate Wood, lodging at 31 Britannia Street, admitted to stealing a pair of trousers and a pair of boots belonging to her husband from 107 Bedford Street, but pleaded that he did not give her any money. A number of convictions were recorded against the defendant, who was sent to prison for two months with hard labour. Police Gazette. 1st of June, 1917. Alberta Wood, Criminal Records Office number 180802, was sentenced as Kate Wood at Leicester Bury Borough Petty Sessions to six months imprisonment for stealing night dress, etc. Previously convicted of miscellaneous larcenies and minor offences at Nottingham as Kate Wood. Leicester and Southampton as Alberta Wood. Leicester <laughs> Daily Post, 2nd of January 1918. Borough Quarter Sessions at the Town Hall before Recorder Marston C. Buzzard, Esquire, KC. The, follow, the Follies of Drink. Kate Wood, 60, charwoman, was indicted for stealing two pairs of ladies' knickers and two chemises, the property of Sarah Ann Robinson. She was also indicted for stealing a pair of combinations and a child's undershirt, the property of Francis Maria Jarvis. 
Detective Sergeant Bone, the accused of being living in the common lodgings houses apart from her husband. There are numerous convictions for felony against her. The main cause of trouble appears to be drink. She did not usually pawn the stolen articles, but sold them to different people. The court recorder. You will serve nine months imprisonment and perhaps this will give you time to reflect on the follies of drink. Put that damn dog in the room, will you? I blame my husband. He was hardly married to William. He was no kind of regular life. He never stopped rambling or drinking or gambling, at least not while I was his wife. I never knew what he was up to, except for those postcards he'd send. Just a couple of lines to say I'm doing fine and he'd sign, Will I am your old friend. Now and again out of nowhere he'd come back with his hat in his hand. And I could never stay angry with that dear sweet impossible man. Sometimes we'd sing in the kitchen, sometimes we'd cuddle and spoon. But mostly I couldn't help feeling like I'd married the man in the moon. He always had his explanation, like butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. It was never his fault, and when he got caught, he'd come and to get me to bail him out. No matter how much I pleaded, he just wouldn't take care of himself. He collapsed in the street, so broke down and beat. There was nothing they could do to help. Now and again, out of nowhere, he'd come back with his hat in his hands. And I could never stay angry with that dear, sweet, impossible man. Sometimes we'd sing in the kitchen, sometimes we'd cuddle and spoon. But mostly I couldn't help feeling like I'd married the man in the moon. It was hard being married to William. Thank you very much, Kim. Fantastic. Uh, Final addition to the life of uh, Alberta Wood. Um, so very interesting. I, I hope you're able to follow that. Um, you'll see that this is a load of court documents. And I suppose we're quite interested in, well, one of the things we immediately notice is, is how little we actually hear the voice of our subjects um, and how much we hear other people speaking about them and usually accusing them um and yeah so it'd be very interesting just to take a little break now and hear particularly from our panelists um thoughts all the all the subjects of these three um events we're doing are people who have been prosecuted under the vagrancy act i don't think any of the court appearances we heard tonight were actually uh, ones which were under the Vagrancy Act, but we know that she was prosecuted under the Vagrancy Act. And I suppose one of the things we're interested in is, would it be any different today? Would any of the people we're talking about be treated better um, or understood more or whatever? So perhaps I can go to Hannah Slater um, and ask her to unmute and uh, just react in any way you, you think to the first of our subjects for the night. Um, would it be the same now, Hannah? Are you there? I'm, I'm trusting in Zoom fashion that you are. Yes. You have to start speaking and then you'll appear. Marvellous. Uh, yes, great. Thank you. Um, uh, different now uh, for Kate Alberta Wood. Um, I think that um, it's a question. We know that the situation now is very piecemeal across the country in terms of where people are affected by the Vagrancy Act um, and 
it could happen now that she would be prosecuted on, under it for the um, offences around stealing and so on and, and really miss out on um, mental health support, um, employment support, um, housing-led responses and so on. Um, we know that it was 1,422 people were prosecuted under the Vagrancy Act in 2019 to 2020, um, with wide variation across the country. I've not seen the figures for Leicester specifically. Um, so you were telling me that some police forces really use it for virtually anything to criminalise people, and other police forces hardly use it at all. Name the name the serial offender. Who are the worst at this? Well, I don't want to name and shame too much, but I also okay. I've got the figures for 2018 here, and um, by police force, which are based on FOI data, because these stats aren't routinely published by the Ministry of Justice, I don't believe. Um, but for example, Gwent, so the, the Vagrancy Act applies in England and Wales. Gwent had zero prosecutions or arrests under the, sorry, arrests under the Vagrancy Act. Leicestershire, which I believe is where Kate was from, uh, 12 people um, prosecuted on, in uh, 2018 under the Vagrancy Act. So Kate could have been one of those people. Um, and then, what, you know, about, what about gender distribution? I mean, we found far fewer women, but it may just be obviously as now that women are living differently or finding protection in different ways or whatever. Um, was there, was there, yeah. is there roughly equal distribution of? We have quite poor statistics on that. There's certainly no gender breakdown, I'm afraid, and that would be a really fascinating. Um, thing uh, you know we, we do know um that when it comes to people affected by homelessness and being um on the streets and so on um you know it can often you don't see women it doesn't mean that they're not there but um they're perhaps better hidden or hide themselves better because they don't want to be visible um fearing um you know, it, it being very dangerous for them on the streets and so on. Um, but um, yeah, in so, I mean, it's probably a greater proportion of, of men and we all, men as well. And we also know um, perhaps there might be more places for women um, in hostels or refuges because um, domestic violence can sometimes play a role as well and there's there's su some support there but obviously it's not enough. So there's a possibility of course we don't really know why Alberta um, stayed apart from her husband. I know that Kim the actor is very fond of the idea that she is deeply deeply in love with him <laughs> to the end of her life uh, but she may have been taking shelter. Could I go to Nick Krausen and ask ask Nick, why, why did Alberta particularly catch your eye? And I want to say it'd be nice, Sam, our stage manager, if in a moment we could see those three photos, because I think they were there and they were gone, and um, they're really good to see. But Nick, Nick Krausen, can you tell us a little bit about why you were drawn to oh, Alberta? Um... Well, I'd happily have uh, Sam put up the three photos so you don't have to look at me. Um, Sam, but could you put up the photos and we'll listen, we'll listen to Nick and look at these amazing photographs of her. So, I mean, it's highly unusual um, to, to find a photo, to be honest, of the, the, the various individuals that I've been tracking, all of whom have, have been prosecuted for vagrancy. In Alberta's case, it would have been under the false pretenses clause essentially bluffing her way into a property and then um, not paying for a bed and board um, in the morning. Uh, what she then of course escalates is to use of larceny theft which then is principally what we're hearing through those those court cases those transcripts but she's I mean she's she's clearly doing this out of desperation. Um, she's probably more successful at it than the time she gets caught is my suspicion. Um, uh, She's got some considerable um, front with the way that she behaved in Southampton, for example. Um, 
but she's she's moving clearly between the sort of this underbelly of of common lodging houses the workhouse in leicester or workhouses further afield and in between jail well, perhaps you, perhaps you can help people not everybody necessarily knows nick what what this the common lodging houses what kind of places were those well essentially they are uh, mass occupation properties uh, run on a private basis their quality uh, could be very varied but often was quite poor uh, the authorities had tried to regulate them because they were seen as potentially um, dens of iniquity thief them and uh, disease uh, they vary in size from quite small operations to very vast operations depending where you are in the country and why why might uh, by the way i want to invite anybody in our audience to just stick a question or a comment in the uh, in the chat bit which is on the right and i'll relay them to our uh, speakers and why would somebody be staying in a common lodging house rather than the workhouse or vice versa what's well, the difference uh, the, you would expect the quality to be just a step up from the workhouse experience and you've got some money to be able to pay for your accommodation so clearly she's she's doing stuff i mean one of the problems we have with some of the labels that that are recorded is that we don't know i mean that's a snapshot of a given moment and it's many women kind of had multiple roles um some of them very seasonal so she could be doing some hosiery work alongside the charring um equally sometimes charwoman could be a euthanism for a prostitute um so it's and she, she lives to a considerable age, surely, for a woman of that time. She must have had a pretty fine constitution, yeah? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily unusual, but uh, life expectancy, yes, well beyond what we would, would expect for, for that era, and particularly for someone who's kind of in, in a sort of homeless uh, spectrum. And uh, John Quill Panting, who is a producer we're working with for the Radio 4 piece that we're going to make next year, is asking, do we know what happened to Kate and Alberta's children? We know that one died um, at about age six. Uh, Does she have descendants, do you think? Living descendants at all? Not that I'm aware of. I know I'm, some of your uh, subjects, yes. some of your subjects do, which yes. is interesting. Um, just one more question um, is Lucy Bell was asking again if um, this is for you, Hannah, if you could just remind us of those important figures um, of, well, actually Lucy's asking the number of people arrested with reference to the Vagrancy Act since its inception. <laughs> since that's almost 200 years, I doubt that either of our speakers I can, know I can that. give you some maths. Well, someone could do the maths, but I can tell you that uh, just prior to to the, the five-year period in the run-up to the First World War, so 1909 uh, forward, the annual number of convictions uh, was 39,000 uh, for either the rough sleeping clause or the begging clause. You got to then add in that people were being convicted under the refusal to do the workhouse duty, under the um, uh, false pretenses element, and also gaming was exceptionally popular uh, as a moral panic during this period, and that fell in under the under the terms of the act as well. And well, Hannah, 30, finally, can you just remind us of the numbers, current yeah. numbers? Um, Thirty-nine thousand over that five-year period before the. No, it's per year. Per year. Per year. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, so I guess since it's actually except inception, hundreds of thousands of people will have been prosecuted mm. against them under the Vagrancy Act. Um, in a fight um, in, well, last year, 2019 to 2020, it certainly was nowhere as high as 39,000, um, but it was 1,422 people, um, which is not an insignificant number of people to, um, to be, dishing out this very Dickensian sort of punishment to that we know does absolutely nothing to tackle the root causes of rough sleeping or begging and in fact just makes their situation worse so um and, and I would say that I believe um, there have been campaigns for for 
for a long time to scrap the Vagrancy Act, which you probably know more than me about, Nick. But um, it feel it seems like it's um, something which ebbs and flows with its use over time and we think it's sort of fading away and not being used again anymore and then it'll sort of come back and have a bit of a moment um, so i mean it's been a it's been a, a piece of legislation used for all sorts of purposes hasn't it um, and even criminalizing um uh, low-level prost prostitution sex work uh, from uh, uh, Nick was telling us gallery owners who who exhibit naked people in their galleries I mean it's just been one of those catch-all pieces of legislation hasn't it and uh, um, I just wanted to ask two more questions and let's get let's get on um, I suppose to both of you um, first of all Nick would there at that time have been, been any help uh, available regarding alcoholism and I suppose then Hannah what are your thoughts about now whether there whether um, Alberta would be helped with her alcoholism or how long she might have to wait to be helped Nick uh, first of all do you do you have any sense of that um, depending on your wealth would have affected it may be that you could have been sent to a private asylum if you were sufficiently wealthy enough uh, but the, the, the understanding of treatment wouldn't be anything like we understand it today, obviously. Um, the temperance movement would try to sponsor you, and we sometimes see some of our individuals offering to take the pledge uh, before a, 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 a judge in, in an attempt to try and avoid a, a prison sentence. So, really no. And nowadays, Hannah? Um, depressingly, I think that... Um, it's a similar situation in the support services around alcohol and drug use are very, very poor um, for rough sleepers and um, indeed many people. And um, that's one of the, 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 the key um, areas, support services that we really need to be looking to expand as an alternative to enforcement um, if, if we're trying to um, really get to the bottom of solving and ending and begging, we really need to tackle those issues with support services rather than enforcement. So that's one of the comments people are making about is it a problem that is now to do with the police directly or the police sort of just end up being the ones mopping up I suppose um, um, and, you know, yeah please. so um, quite varied across the country um, and I would say that some police forces are really great at seeing they know that um, they that people have other problems they want to be able to help and fix the root causes um but I, I think a lot of police forces also know that there's few places to refer people into um crisis has just produced a guide which will be launched soon which is worked on and endorsed with the national police chiefs council it's endorsed by them and it covers all the alternatives that police forces can use rather than enforcement rather than so, um, criminalizing people under that under the act and i know people also use asbos now as an alternative to the act which is not dissimilar i think we should move on um let's go to thank you for all those questions by the way and keep them coming and by all means put answers also if you have them because i know we have a quite a distinguished audience present if you know the answers put them in um let's go to our second subject who is james butcher and ask um the actor jake good to just introduce uh, james butcher to us and then we'll read about james uh, <coughs> okay uh james James Butcher, known as Jimmy, was born in Witten, Lancashire. Jimmy was born a bastard near Blackburn in 1861 or thereabouts. This was the year of the first recorded steam-powered merry-go-round in nearby Bolton. Merry-go-round might be a metaphor for his life. He was brought up in poverty and apparently raised by a single mother who within 20 years was herself resident in the workhouse. 
Jimmy became an indoor farm servant in Westmoreland before joining the army aged 23 and eventually being posted to India. Some six years later, his regiment was stationed back in Preston and Jimmy was described as temperate and good. A couple of years after that, he started engaging in the vagrant behavior which led to nine civil court appearances and dismissal from the army. The merry-go-round begins in Lancashire with repeated jail time for drunkenness, begging and rough sleeping. This continues till his 81st prison sentence when aged in his late 60s. Jimmy circulated far and wide from Lancashire to Kent, Devon to Yorkshire. He clearly had a sense of humour, had a disregard for authority and maybe mental illness. He was convicted of stealing coats and boots on more than one occasion, which might, however, seem a reasonable adaptive behaviour given his itinerancy. He got about. Very good. Thank you. Let's hear um, the transcripts of uh, Jimmy, uh, James Jimmy Hornby Butcher. Thank you. James Jimmy Hornby Butcher, born 1861, died, who knows? Birth certificate, register, District Blackburn. 1861, births in the district of Witton in the county of Lancaster. When, when born? 15th of November, 1861, Witton Parade, Witton. Name? James Hornby. Sex. Boy. Name and surname of father. Name and maiden name of mother. Jane Hornby Butcher. Rank or profession of father. Uh, signature, description and residence of informant. Jane Hornby Butcher, mother, Witten Parade, Witten. When registered? 30th November. Signature of registrar. William Sprague registrar. Army attestation and discharge record WO97. 1st of November 1884. James Butcher, regimental number 929, Royal North Lancashire Regiment. Age? 23. Apparently. Age? Physical equivalent to 19. Height? 5 foot 4 and a half inches. Weight? 128 pounds. Best measurement? 33 and 3 quarters. Complexion? Fresh. Eyes? Great. Hair? Yeah. Brown? Religious domination. Church of England. Military history sheet. Service at home and abroad. Home. 31st of October, 1884 to 25th of February, 1886. One year, 180, 118 days. Then the East Indies. 26th of Feb, 1886 to 29th of November, 1891. Five years, 277 days. Then back home. 30th of November, 1891 to 10th of August, 1894. Two years, 254 days. Next of kin. Brothers. Albert and John in Hornby near Lancaster. Sister. Annie in Collingwood near Barrow. Statement of services, number 929, James Butcher. Home, Fullwood Barracks, Preston. 30th of November, 1891, service forfeited for fixing rate of pension. 6th of May, 1893, imprisoned by civil power. Lost 14 days. 20th of May, 1893, released. Lost 205 days. 6th of May, 93, Forth forfeited one penny in good conduct pay. 11th of December, 93, imprisoned by civil power. 29 days. 9th of January 94. Released. 86 days. 11th of December 93. Forfeited one penny in good conduct pay. 5th of April 94. Imprisoned by civil power. 7 days. 12th of April 94. Released. 4 days. 16th of April 94. Imprisoned by civil power. 14 30th days. 30th of April 94. Released. 17 17th of May 94. Imprisoned by civil power. Days. 1 June 94. Released. 19. 20th of June, 94. Prison by civil 27th power. 27th of June, 94. Released. 12th of June, 94. Prison by civil power. 27th of June, 94. Released. 29th of July, 94. Prison by civil power. 5th of August, 94. 
Released. 7th of August, 1894. Imprisoned by civil power for begging. Discharged from the army. 10th of August, 1894. Total service forfeited? Two years, 245 days. Lancashire Evening Post, 14th of November, 1895. Old soldiers crazed. At Lancaster this morning, James Butcher was charged with being a rogue and a vagabond. I deny the charge. I'm a working man. Police constable, I found a man asleep behind the Henry Prince William Hotel at midnight. He had been seen in the area for several days, attracting attention by trying to polish the horseshoe of John of Gaunt's legend and, and cleaning shop windows. I am a former soldier who has been in India and there I used to dream about the horseshoe. Mayor, butcher, I tell you, go and get work and I will discharge you. Northampton Mercury, 1st of December, 1899. Toast up divisional petty sessions. Couldn't always work. James Butcher Tramp was charged with refusing to work at Toaster Workhouse on November 28th. The magistrate. Why did you leave working? I can't always be working, sir. <laughs> In that case, I sentence you 10 days hard labour. Foxton Hive, Sandgate and Cheriton Herald, 15th September 1900. One month in durance vile. On Thursday, James Butcher was sentenced to a month's hard labour for being drunk and disorderly and of disgraceful behaviour on the 12th. Constable, I had earlier in the day witnessed the prisoner bathing in his trousers near the sewer below East Cliff before hearing reports that he was drunk and behaving in the manner complained of. Magistrate, are there any doubts had about his sanity? Mm -hmm. Dr Bateman, medical officer of health, he is sane. Folkestone, Hyde, Sandgate and Cheriton Herald, 10th of November, 1900. Police court Saturday before the mayor, Councillor Carpenter, Alderman Spurgeon and Pledge and Messrs Hode, Whitewick, Vaughan and Stainer. Poor fella. James Butcher, charged with being drunk and disorderly in the high street. PC Nash, I was on duty 1.30 on Friday when I saw the defendant very drunk. I witnessed him being turned out from several shops and then went into Earl's shop and I was called to eject him. He turned on me saying, I will kick your brains out. You're a liar. I took you to the police station and locked you up. You were very violent. Superintendent Lilly, I can confirm that the man was both drunk and violent. I was not drunk. I was going around the town trying to get a living and the policeman chased me about like a cat chasing Chief, a man. Chief Constable, this man is the perfect pest. I'm sorry he has returned to Folkestone. I am not being treated as other men. Me, poor fella, me. I'm hunted down like a dog. Mayor Carpenter, Chair, one month hard labour. Thank you, sir. Folkestone Hyde, Sandgate and Cheriton Herald, 15th of December 1900. To leave the town. Folkestone Police Court, James Butcher, brought before the court on a warrant. Chief Constable. The man is a perfect pest. Beef sea sales. I heard him using bad language. I will leave town and go to Romney Marsh to work if you would deal leniently with me, your lordship. 1901 census, township of Folkestone, Ellen Kent. Homeless wanderers observed by the police reported to the registrar wandering near the harbour. Stephen Dunn, single, 43, boatman, Kent, Folkestone. James Butcher, single, 39, agricultural labourer, Lancashire, Blackburn. Ellen James, married, 37, tailoress, Kent, Rotherhide. Lily Ellie, Capel, widow, 23, nun, Kent, Folkestone. Wakefield Prison, register of offenders. Name? James Butcher. Date and place of committal? 19th, 19th of December, 1901, Pontefract. Offence? Stealing a pork pie. Sentence? 14 days hard labour. Education? R and W one. Age, height, colour of hair. Forty five foot four and three quarters. Brown. Trade. Labourer. Religion. Place of birth. Church. Blackburn. 
date of discharge? 1st of January 1902. Oakston Hythe and Sandgate and Cheriton Herald, 27th of August 1904. For Oakston Borough Bench, Thursday, before Alderman J. Banks in the chair, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton and Mr. G. Swaffer. A perfect pest. Magistrates Clerk, James Butcher, you are charged with using obscene language in the tram road. I'm not guilty. Caroline Piper, married woman of Sanic Gardens. Yesterday, I was on the tram road when that man addressed me, passing a remark about a man laying on the grass. I ignored him, but he repeated the remark. I told him I had no wish to have a conversation, whereupon he began to make use of very obscene language. I was insulted in a similar manner by the prisoner four and a half years ago. I found a constable and he took that man into custody. Constable, on being approached by Mrs Piper, I sought out Jimmy Butcher and I arrested him for using obscene language to a woman. I am innocent. I have the greatest respect for women. I've not seen this lady before. Magistrate's clerk, has this man been examined by the police surgeon? Chief Constable, yes, but Dr Bateman could find nothing the matter with him. I, I'm not quite right. In Devonshire, they told me I was a harmless lunatic, but I've not been locked up in an asylum. You will finish up by being brought here as an incorrigible rogue. I, I'm innocent. I will not be tried here. I will go to quarter sessions to be tried. He's a perfect pest in and about the town. I have a list here of 11 convictions against him in this very borough. He has been convicted twice for begging and twice for being drunk and disorderly just this year. His last conviction was on the 8th of August. Chairman Butcher, I sentence you to 14 days hard labour at Canterbury. Now, Mrs Piper, we feel very much indebted to you for bringing that dirty fellow before us this morning. We've given him all the penalty we can, which is 14 days, and we very much regret that we cannot send him before the recorder. If your husband had been here, I would have said to him, give him a thundering good thrashing. Yes. Oakston Express, 14 September 1904. A pest. A well-known character, James Butcher, was charged with being drunken and incapable. P.C. Simmons, at 12.55 early this morning, I saw the defendant lying upon the Beach Street steps. He was unable to stand, so I took him into custody. I had got among a lot of toff, and they had made me drink. Inspector Swift, Butcher has been before this court three times just recently and 16 times together. He is a thorough pest to the town. It takes one policeman all his time to keep him out of the public houses. Find 10 shillings plus costs or 14 days. Have you any goods in order to pay the fine? Yes, in the pawn shops. <laughs> Wokeston Express, 5th of November 1904. Police court, Monday before E.T. Ward Esquire in the chair. Well, and gentlemen. All damage. A well known character named Jay was placed in the dock. Charged with committing of the Isle of Cyprus public house and uh, William previously... Holford, landlord, about 10 40 hours in the bar with my man James Spicer, and we, we heard a tapping at the door. James opened it, and Butcher, who was carrying a tin can, said, Yes, this is the can. Yes, he asked for some beer. He was told to go away as we were closed, and James shut the door on him. Immediately, we heard the smash of glass. We both ran outside and found the plate glass window, the bar broken. We ran after Butcher, who was making off towards the bail steps, where we overtook him. I asked him, why you broke my window? Because I want to get locked up. We took him up to the rendezvous street and handed him over to the police sergeant, Dunster. When I returned to the bar, I found that tin can on the ground outside the window. The window was valued at six pounds and fifteen shillings. Clerk to the court, James Butcher. Do you have any questions to put to Mr Holford? He has brought it on himself by kicking me. I am flesh and blood, not stone. James Spicer, barman, I corroborate what Mr Holford said. Why did you beat me halfway down the street? What nonsense. P.C. Dunster. I asked Butcher why he had done it and took him to the cells. Serves Holford right, sir. Chief Constable, I would ask the bench to commit this man to the quarter sessions. 
Do you have you anything to say? say would... Yes, I wish to say a lot. Take, Take my, my advice my... and say nothing. You'll be committed to trial at the court of sessions and bail is set at one surety of £20 and himself in £20. In that case, I will write to my brother. Money's no object to him. Lancashire Evening Post, 18th of May 1905. Tramp stole a misfit. James Butcher, Tramp, got 14 days hard labour at Chester yesterday for stealing two pairs of boots from a shop. Magistrate Clare, what, what have you to say? I wanted a pair of boots very bad. But do you don't have two pair? Well, I got hold of a small pair first, but they wouldn't fit me. And I went and got a larger pair. <laughs> Yorkshire Evening Post, 23rd of February, 1912. I, I can do it on my head. Amusing defence of a farm labourer at Scarborough. At Scarborough today, James Butcher, 50, farm labourer, charged with trespassing passing on the North East Railway at Scarborough, offered an amusing defence. I have a lot to say if I'm given a straight lash of the law and a full crack of the whip. They never locked me up at Driftfield where the superintendent said, Jim, Go out of town. You will never do any good here. Chief Constable, I understand from one of my Scarborough officers that that man told him that he had been convicted 60 times. I find you 10 shillings and sixpence or 14 days in Wakefield by default. Thank you, Your Worship. But to Wakefield, I must go. I can do it standing on my head. Sunderland Echo, 28th of May, 1912. Quite the latest. When James Butcher, 57, labourer, stepped into the dock at Scarborough yesterday, he was wearing a collar that was evidently been made out of a newspaper bill, for on it was printed latest news. It was Butcher's third appearance, and when sentenced to a month's imprisonment for drunkenness, he said, That'll do, thank you. Police Gazette, 11th of June, 1918, case number 22. In custody at Bridge North Borough, charged with stealing boots from a shop door. James Butcher, criminal record office number 34639057, aged 55, height five foot four and a half, complexion fresh, hair brown, eyes grey, a labourer, a native of Blackburn, previous convictions of miscellaneous larcenies and offences, Bridge North, Lancaster, South Moulton, Newport Mon, Folkestone, Wolverhampton, Chester, North Allerton, Driffield, Gateshead, Leeds and Scarborough was sentenced at Bridge North Borough Police Court on the 10th of June 1918 to three months in prison. Yorkshire Evening Post, 17th of September 1921. Ram instead of paint, theft from Ficker who did a good turn. James Butcher, 60, a labourer who had occasionally been employed out of charity by the Vicar of Scalby, was charged at Scarborough today with stealing two shillings, a shoe brush and file of the total value of four shillings and threepence, the property of the vicar. Magistrate Clerk, yesterday James Butcher was sentenced to three months hard labour for stealing two tank cards at Scarborough. I admit I had done the vicar in for two bob. I had been given it to buy paint. You see, Taylor, instead, you bought beer. I bought rum. If you give me another chance, I will put a pan in the poor box at Christmas on account of uh, God is short of a couple of bob and the... Uh, the prisoner made a number of rambling statements before declaring... I am tired and sick of talking. The magistrate, by your own admission, you are guilty. So your sentence is to be a fortnight in Wakefield Prison to run concurrently with the sentence passed yesterday. Yorkshire Evening Post, 6th of May, 1929, a student of law returns to his home, the workhouse. It was James Butcher's 81st appearance in court and he was accused under the 1824 Vagrancy Act of wandering abroad without visible means of subsistence and failing to give a good account of himself. As far as having no visible means of subsistence goes, my case doesn't come under that act at all. I have a book which shows you all about the law what they can have you up for and what they cannot. He proceeded with a statement and after about five minutes, the magistrate's clerk intervened. 
Is that all? Oh, I can talk for a week. <laughs> now, I will discharge you if you agree to turn to the workhouse. With the greatest pleasure in the world. It's my home. I'm supposed to be daft. I was in York Asylum four years and in the workout for the last two. That's the last we hear of him. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the uh, internet equivalent of applause um, to some actors who've had very little time to just read these quite wordy and complex documents. I see that a busy discussion is going on in the group chat, but let me intervene on that and go to our um, panelists a little bit. And again, uh, same order really, I suppose, Hannah Slater. Um, any observations about uh, Jimmy? Is he, uh, would his life be different now? Do we see people like him now? What do you think? Yeah, um, so a few observations. Um, I know mm. the point about repeated convictions. Um, I think that's something that we tend to see quite often now. Um, a lot of people who've been prosecuted under the Vagrancy Act have been prosecuted multiple times. And all that does is really racks up fines for them and makes it harder for them to get out of homelessness. It sort of really hammers home this point that it's not solving anything. Um, and then, um, we, you know, um, I, it was interesting to, to hear that um, he, that James was, um, uh, a soldier and um we know um that this the vagrancy act was really brought in to deal with soldiers returning from the napoleonic wars and um sort of wandering around the streets uh, probably with terrible mental health problems and actually now we you know, we do still see veterans on the streets. That is an issue that has never been resolved through the Vagrancy Act or other means. Um, it's interesting. So th there's a bit of a conversation going on um, in the chat about social housing and the complete lack of social housing, affordable housing, whether through social housing or affordable private rents. And, and um, it's interesting that in recent that I think earlier this year, the government has an, an announced that um, they will prioritise veterans with PTSD for social housing to get them out, uh, to get to try and prevent homelessness there. But the question remains, is there enough social housing for them to go into? There really, really is not. And we know that people who are on the streets um, homelessness is not considered a priority need for social housing. So, you know, that that's a key area that needs to be considered as well. Um, but yeah, really interesting to see some of the, the things that are really running through and just have ne never been dealt with in 200 years. Um, Nick, would you say that uh, on uh, would nowadays do you think he would be classified as a man with PTSD as a as a veteran with PTSD do you think that soldiering uh, in India he was in India two three years um, affected him in a similar kind of way Perf perfectly possible I mean we certainly look at other characters um, individuals that we've reconstructed in this work who very clearly are displaying PTSD symptoms um, and you kind of you know they were fighting in particular campaigns um, overseas, which we now know were particularly bloody and horrendous. So the prospects there. The problem with Jimmy's war uh, service record is that the vital bit that tells me where he was uh, whilst in India is cut off in the, the, the image of us whether he started for the campaigns um, in India. So my suspicion is that he's got something underlying, but whether also sometimes whether he's he he can through isolation wants to other sort of separate himself and so perhaps plays up on certain characteristics. Again, I don't know. And so when he when part. he says that uh, I've been called daft. Uh, you, you, it's difficult to tell, isn't it, whether that is him sort of 
using the tropes which have been used against him to to get out of trouble or whether it is actually what he feels. I mean, one of the repeated things we've discovered, and I'd like to open it up to anybody to ask any questions and to any of our actors who might like to make uh, any comments on um, approaching these people. But, you know, the, the, the way these people are talked about and categorized um, and named even then again, that sort of does feel sickeningly uh, familiar today. Um, so let me go to our actors. Um, um, so uh, I, I wonder where I could do this risky thing of asking an actor, asking Jimmy, uh, Jimmy, if you were, uh, if I was to ask you, uh, are you putting it on, Jimmy? Are you putting it on? Ask you to speak as Jimmy. Um, is that your life out there or what? Uh, hang on, we've got, so, sorry, could you repeat that, Adrian? There's a little bit of interference. Uh, that's all right. I'm asking you to slip into Jimmy for a moment. Oh. And from the inside of Jimmy, oh, that makes all the difference. The, the ma magic of theatre. <laughs> Wonderfully achieved. Now you are Jimmy. Um, from the inside of Jimmy, uh, j j how do you think Jimmy would answer the question? Are you putting it on? Is that an act or is that who you are? Uh, you've, got a, you've got a duck and dive. You've got to do what you need to do, haven't you? You know? And what came what what came first, Jimmy? The the drinking or the or the um, or the uh, traumatic experience? Sorry, that means a really bad experience that you might have had when you were uh, out in India. Were you drinking out there, or what was your life like out there? There yeah, wasn't much drink out there. Quite a lot of mangoes, uh, mosquitoes. Not yeah, a lot of drinking. No, I never really started drinking till I got back. And uh, that was after a realisation, really. You know, uh, <coughs> I'd served my country. I'd created a lot of profits for my masters and betters, exploiting brown people over there. Well, I got back here and I realised if I was born one of them, then I could do bugger all the fucking time. Have a drink every night. Nobody cares. I and I got a taste for travelling, so I decided I'd have as much of it as I could for as long as I could. That is a convincing ring about it. I think you've given him a, a fairly political edge there. We hope he, he was that politically conscious man. Can I ask the same of Alberta? Can I just lapse into Alberta? Alberta, what about all those thefts? All that stuff you're nicking. Why, why, why what's that all about? How do you expect me to feed and clothe my kids and myself? My husband deserted me. So you were on your own, um, bringing up your kids on your own and doing that and traveling around? Yes. Yes. And nowhere proper to say. We had to say on friends floors and it's it's a bad line back into the early 19th century this is hard work Bring must be the crossing the century's line for them kids and i needed to yeah, we're losing you across the mists of time, Alberta, but that's inevitable given the time traveling that we're having to do. Adrian, um, could I, Adrian, yes, could please, I just Nick. Jump in there with something that please, uh, Alberta. Someone else sense, uh... um, and that's, that's the sense that obviously what I'm kind of reconstructing from are kind of institutional sources, and obviously their survival rate uh, in the archives is considerably greater than anything else that we kind of use and the challenge uh, and the absence for the historian is those sources that allow us to understand the kinship networks that exist those friendship networks that might exist that perhaps are helping sustain people and when we get a sense that a lot of those who are characterized as beggars do remain in areas and particular districts for prolonged periods clearly supported and tolerated by um, the community around them and perhaps only when their behaviours become um, a little too interfering in the day-to-day -day lives do we then see the, the authorities kind of intervening. So I, I, 
I'm conscious as a historian that there is there are missing dimensions to, to, to our reconstruction. So it's only a partial um, version. It's frustrating and it's interesting uh, having worked for these um, a day or two on these uh, on these transcripts um, that we are aware that we're only hearing one side of the story. And even when our subjects voices are supposedly recorded, we have a strong sense of how mediated they are. And I think what this gives us at Carbo Citizens is a sense that when we come to make a more substantial piece of work out of this, it is sort of our job to supply the other half of that story, those kinship networks you're talking about, which we touched on last week. Um, and uh, try to fill out these people who are otherwise entirely either medicalized or criminalized or you know somebody was speaking earlier in the chat about the violence of the discourse here and we haven't done anything to make the, the discourse more violent we've simply read out what people say and it seems pretty intrinsic um, that it's there um, so I think we're, we're drawing to our close unless anybody has any other question they would like to ask while you're thinking of any question. I just want to thank a couple of people. We've been using these little sharings to experiment uh, with things. And one of the experiments we've done, which I don't think you've managed to see all of tonight from technical glitches is uh, working with um, one of our members, Christina Espejo, who's an animator. Um, and in future, we'd be looking at animating them. And last week, we worked with a sound designer, Maria Twedje, um, to see how we could fill out the stories in that way. Um, and I should also thank Birmingham University, who have supported this, and of course, ACE, who support us. Uh, and I'm reading now from my instructions, and I'm told to say that the info for links of people who wish to donate to Galbo Citizens will appear um, shortly. But Maya says the animations were amazing, and we did see them, which is great. This, uh, um, 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 and Sarita is still learning how to use Zoom, but you just have to type in a question there. Um, any last observation or question from any of our audience or any of our actors? Very, very welcome, please. Um, Linda, I think you were asking about the actual technical meaning as a lawyer of being of the Vagrancy Act, what crime it is that you are accused specifically, what is it that you have done? Hannah, can you briefly say what, what is it? Because we read it and it's eight pages long, but specifically what is the, what is the nub of the crime that people are supposed to have committed? You need to unmute yourself, Hannah. This is the classic Zoom conversation. Unmute, please. Oh, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I understand that um, from what you were saying about the massive list of things that people can be prosecuted for, my favourite of which is fortune telling. Um, but um, currently, well, from the data that I have, um, currently people are prosecuted for three main offences, and those are begging, sleeping out, so rough sleeping, or being in enclosed premises for an unlawful lawful purpose, which is sort of you're moving into the squatting territory as well. So not really stopping people from even finding shelter for themselves. Um, so yeah, th those are those are the main areas in which it would be used now. Deployed current, that's how it would be used now, particularly, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a question from Lucy Bear, from um, sorry from Jane about what our desired outcomes for this evening are. And the answer is really um, cardboard citizens works on telling untold stories, and um, we work very closely with homeless people or, or the performers you saw tonight have personal experience of homelessness, and we sort of feel that therefore there's a an added weight or authenticity to our storytelling and that some of some of the people around us have a right to tell these stories. And the desired outcome really is we're working towards a Radio 4 drama, which will be next year, which will be sort of harvesting some of this experience and trying to work out how to tell the stories 
of people from that time and how to relate them in an interesting way to, to now. So we need to work out how to deal with the mass of verbiage, which we threw at you tonight, um, how to abbreviate in the right way and how to find the right conversations. And that very important thing that Nick Krausen said about how to um, supply the part which isn't there, which uh, the fiction really, will, it'll have to be fiction, it'll have to be inspired fiction about who were the people around our people when they weren't in court, what were they doing, when they were happy, what were they doing, when they were on the road and things were good, what were they doing. So that's our goal. Um, and finally, Hannah um, has put in the, in the um, chat um, the Crisis Scrap the Act campaign, so please do support that. Um, I just want to give a big hand to all our actors and do the um, internet version of applause, um, and I hope you will too. Yes, you can do that kind of applause too. Um, and thanks very much on uh, a morning's work. It's great to see what people have done there. And thank you all so much for coming. And we'll, we'll end it there for the night. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, our guests. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Nick. Thanks a lot. Thank you.